Hi YouTube, this is Evie. Welcome back to my channel and today I have another video for you all that is part of my ongoing December series that is all about how to get involved in the real life BDSM community. Today I'm going to be telling you all about my first experiences at dungeons and what to expect during your first trip to a dungeon. Now, I will say I wish I could take you all on a tour of the dungeon that I go to, but unfortunately it is currently closed because they are relocating, so hopefully sometime in the future I will be able to show you guys pictures of what an actual dungeon looks like. But for now, we're going to do a little bit of a theater of the mind type of journey, and I'm going to tell you all about what it's like at BDSM Dungeons. Now, the mental image that people have of dungeons as being like dark and dank and like scary and like poorly lit and like people are all wearing like latex and gimp masks and all that stuff can be totally 100% true. But it is not always the case. I think a lot of times people are pretty pleasantly surprised by how clean and organized and well lit that a lot of dungeons actually are. The lighting is actually mostly for safety reasons, I feel like, but uh, they are very modern and clean and not scary, I think, in most senses, but it depends on the kind of party that you're going to. The kind of party that I first experienced was actually a pet play party. Uh, this particular dungeon that I went to, uh, when you go in, the very first thing you're going to notice at pretty much every one of the public dungeons that I've ever been to is they have like a counter where you sign in. This is where you pay if you haven't prepaid online for the particular party. They'll also uh, check your ID to make sure you're of legal age. This is also where you can buy a membership card because normally these places are members only. They will have oftentimes either a specific day of the month where you can go in and, and try out and experience the dungeon either for free or at a discounted rate or they have like a try try it out like a taster pass kind of thing we can go to one party for free and then after that you have to buy a membership which can be pretty expensive it can be anywhere between like 60 and 100 dollars depending on the specific area and the specific uh, dungeon that you're wanting to buy a membership to but generally they are members only you will also have to fill out a consent form and what this basically means is that you have to initial and read all of the rules and regulations of this particular dungeon. Normally you'll see things about like what kinds of play are restricted, usually like water sports, scat, blood sports. Uh, sometimes suspension isn't allowed, sometimes gags aren't allowed. Depends a lot, so make sure you actually read what these waivers mean. Um, I'll also in include things about what the dungeon monitors are, are there to do, uh, you know, what the house safe words are, because normally red, green, and yellow are considered the house safe words, and if a DM hears the word red, they will go over to the scene to make sure everything is okay, make sure everything is being handled properly. Um, it'll also just talk about liability, if anybody gets injured, things of that nature. And once you actually pay and you sign your consent waiver, then you can go in. This is where things can be a, a little bit different depending on, on what actual dungeon you're in. Most of the ones I've been to, you go in and then there's like a, a smaller sort of alcove room with like lockers or, or cubby holes to like put your things. These may or may not actually have locks on them. It is a good idea to bring your lock if you can because sometimes people like to ex steal people's expensive BDSM equipment or their wallets or whatever. It's just a fact of life no matter where you are. This is also normally a pretty good space to change because when you are going to a dungeon, you should know that most of the time they are vanilla to the door or streetwear to the door, which means you don't actually wear your kinkwear when you're going to the party. Uh, you are expected to change what you get in there and that is what this particular room is meant for. After that, it's normally a big open area and the particular dungeon that I was going to for this pet play party, it was a really big like wide open concrete floor because most of the time dungeons are in an industrial zone just to like meet all the like city or county requirements of where they're actually allowed to be located so it's, it's like a really big open concrete area that has like wrestling mats in some places there's usually hard points in the ceiling which allow you to do suspensions and rope work uh there is a padoga at sort of the far end of the room which is sort of a wooden structure that it has two uh, points that are an angle like this and then a point at the top here normally there's a ring hanging from it in the middle or a pole that you can reach that is also meant to be used for rope play and suspensions uh, there's normally also things like uh, spanking benches uh, stocks 
there there might be a wall that is sort of like a lattice of wood that you can tie somebody to or restrain them to there's also usually crosses which is a very classical way to tie somebody up especially for impact play scenes you might see cages these could be a you know, variety of different shapes there might be like tall standing cages that have a door you can open and close these are really popular especially in places that have a lot of dance related parties because you can put go-go dancers in them and like suspend them from the ceiling and it's really cool. You might also see ones that are sort of like disguised coffee tables almost that people can sit on top of while somebody is locked inside. Normally there are a lot of different seating options like couches and chairs because a lot of times at parties there's actually a fair amount of socialization that happens. So even when you go to a play party, don't necessarily expect everybody to be playing all the time. I would say Depending on the play party, it's anywhere between 20% play, 80% socializing, and like 60% play, 40% socializing. Just because of how busy these things tend to be, not everybody is always playing. So it's a really good place to sit down and chat and like meet up with friends and negotiate for scenes because there are so many different places you can sit down and relax after scenes. There's normally spots in the room, like either in cabinets or drawers that have safe sex supplies. Uh, they have towels and blankets and, and sheets and things that you can use either uh, to wrap up a submissive as part of aftercare to make sure that things stay clean. They also will have cleaning supplies that you are expected to use after you have used the equipment. That is very important to know uh, when you are going to a dungeon. You should also always clean uh, the service that you're going to be using, even if you think it's already been cleaned. Clean it before and afterwards because you don't want to have to deal with any sort of STI transfer or any sort of transfer of any diseases, be that an STI or the flu or a cold or something like that. There are also usually be uh, two separate areas. Sometimes they're combined, but at least the ones I've been to, they're separate. There's gonna be an aftercare area, which is a place where no play and minimum uh, socialization is expected. It normally has mattresses and there's a bunch of like curtains all around it. So that way uh, people, uh, can kind of calm down and not have to like see other scenes going on and it also sort of facilitates um like quiet and calmness because usually there's less light in this particular area people can just kind of calm down and relax and have a like private quiet aftercare if that's what they need you shouldn't go in an aftercare and use it for show slicing and you shouldn't use it for longer than you need to because they do tend to be uh, pretty high use and high need areas so once you're done with your aftercare uh, move up as soon as you feel like you're ready to and, and make room for other people. There usually will also be a separate space that can look pretty similar, so try not to confuse the two that is just meant for sex. Usually this has a lot of mattresses again, it has sometimes uh, different like sex furniture that people can use, it does also tend to have curtains that may or may not be drawn depending on how uh, voyeuristic or how exhibitionist the people involved are, you know, tend to be for their scenes that involve sex. Uh, the first few times I went to a play party, I never saw anybody have sex. Like, people would have like Hitachis out and like do like orgasm control type of play, but never saw penetrative intercourse until I had been to the dungeon maybe four or five times. And that was like the first time I saw a scene that involved people actually having penetrative sex. But doesn't actually happen as much as you might think. There are parties that are more geared towards uh, sex and like spectating sex and some that are just no no sex and no sexual contact at all so be aware of that when you're going to a dungeon what kind of party you are going to if you're not comfortable watching people have sex or conversely if you really really want to have public sex make sure you do it at a play party where that's uh, expressly allowed and something that is actually encouraged. Um, usually a, a lot of spaces will actually have like multiple rooms to them. So for example, at the dungeon that I was at for my first party, there was a room that had the padoga and the seating area and the aftercare area. Then there was a door that actually went to another room that had more equipment and more furniture at it. They were actually in the midst of constructing and adding more to it at that particular time but it had more of the same furniture. There was also a separate area that was specifically just for medical play that had a lot of like outlet spites that would, people could plug in their various electrical play equipment or their various medical equipment they were using. Sometimes there would also be a specific area that is just meant for blood play. Um, 
if blood plate is allowed in that particular dungeon, they do tend to have it in a separate area because it is such a, a high risk sort of play. Not necessarily in terms of just for the top and the bottom that are doing the scene, but also uh, for disease transfer and it's best to just minimize that potential to just one specific area. A lot of times there will also be like little alcoves where like uh, there's sort of smaller enclosed spaces. Now that is just the furniture you might see. In terms of the kinds of scenes that are pretty common, impact, super super common. I would say this is probably the most common thing that you will see happen at a public dungeon in one form or another. Very classic, somebody getting tied to a cross by their wrists and their ankles getting flogged, that might be with a single flogger, that might be Florentine flogging, you'll see people getting whipped, you'll see people um, getting tied up in rope or suspended, at least where I live that is probably the second most common kind of play outside of impact play. You also see people who mix the two, so for example somebody might be tied up by their wrists and suspended up like this on their tiptoes while they are being flogged or spanked or whipped. Uh, you will also see people engaging in uh, pet play which is less common but even at parties that are not expressly pet play, you will usually see at least one person on a lead and wearing a collar that is, is getting walked around. Um, something that I see happen a, a fair bit is electrical play as well, which can take on a very similar look to impact play depending on the kind of scene that is happening where somebody plugs in like a violent rond or is using a tay zapper and is zapping and poking and prodding at the particular person that is being used. You'll see people who are doing sensory deprivation scenes which usually involves somebody wearing at least a blindfold if not also some sort of cover over their ears or mitts that prevent them from having a sense of touch. They might also be completely bound and restrained. You might people you might uh, see people engaging again in public sex, but that does depend a lot on the particular community and the kind of party that you are at. Now, during your first dungeon experience, if it is the first time you have ever been introduced to that particular community, don't necessarily expect to play right away. I would just take the opportunity uh, to not have any expectations about what's going to happen for that particular evening. That is probably uh, something I wish I would have known when I was first getting involved in the scene. Like, don't walk into a party and don't walk into a situation on the hunt for play because people can tell you're going to be really desperate and it, it sets up unreal, unrealistic expectations because then you look at everybody as a potential play partner and you evaluate and interact with people in a different way. It's much better just go into a scene, go into a party thinking, I'm going to have a good time here, I'm going to meet some people, I'm going to watch some cool scenes, and I'm going to just let whatever happens happens like just let things happen in a natural way rather than trying to like force yourself to play or force a scene to happen especially when you're new because a lot of times people don't play with new people because you know they are an, un are an unknown risk factor and a lot of people especially if they're also relatively new to the scene they would prefer to play with somebody who is more experienced than they are so if you're new and nobody really knows you you might not be able to actually have a scene of your own until you've gone to a couple of parties and gone to a couple of other events and munches and things like that and normally these parties do last until pretty late i would say that a typical dungeon party would have anywhere from doors opening at seven or usually probably about nine o'clock though usually sometimes you'll see seven o'clock especially during the summertime for earlier parties lasting until like midnight or 1 a.m uh usually they will give you a warning when the night is coming to a close around you know you know 20 minutes before, 15 minutes before, 5 minutes before, so that way people can wrap up their scenes and clean up before they actually have to close their doors. Overall, I would say for your first dungeon experience, the most important thing to be would just go in with an open mind. You're going to see a lot of things that maybe you've never actually seen happen in real life before. You're going to hear a lot of sounds you never thought you would hear before. You're going to see a lot of people doing things that you're probably never going to see happen anywhere else. So just go in with an open mind, try not to be judgmental, try not to have any preconceived notions about what you are there to experience and try not to impose on others 
what you want to have happen. Don't go in looking at everybody like a potential dom or a potential top or a potential bottom. Just go in and meet people and have experiences as they are and let it be very organic and natural rather than trying to force things to happen. And that is really all I have to tell you about your potential first experience at a dungeon. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to leave them down below. If you haven't already, please subscribe. I do make videos twice a week. And as always, if you did enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up. And until I see you next time, hope you have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Bye-bye.